today we are uh, lucky to have dr aparna watwe i mean i met her i think uh, 12 years back uh, 10 10 years back at least so i attended one of her class i still remember those things and uh, yeah so dr srimar also saying this session will be live in kottayam uh, nature society facebook page so anyway back to aparna uh, she done her uh, uh, doctorate in vegetation uh, ecology and post doc in studies in rocky plateaus so she is the best person to talk about rock, rocky plateaus uh, so let's learn about uh, all the amazing things about life in those uh, rocky outcrops i think over to you uh, aparna yes thank you should i start yes please you can start and also i would request all of you to switch off your videos it will be better uh, bandwidth uh, Uh, good be here thank you david and thank you hari sir um it's probably my first time to be in an open webinar lecture so quite thrilling in that way but i'm happy to really do this because over the last month and even before that i have realized the power social networking has and uh, we have been using social networking and facebook uh quite often in our conservation programs so i will be talking about uh, a topic which has been part of my studies for a long time almost so that it's become like an obsession so you uh, you know have to be really on your guard because any time i just start speaking about this and sometimes the family gets very bored but uh, apart from that we now are quite a big family itself so today although i am the only person speaking here um i see some people here uh, some colleagues who have been working on this habitat who have been studying this from various angles um many of them have been uh, you know associates for a really long time and uh, we are all part of what we call as rock out drops network probably uh, the only network which is across the world and uh, involves people from different parts uh, of the world uh, different walks of life uh, some are citizens who are very enthusiastic some are naturalists uh, many are scientists um, some are lawyers conservationists who are very passionate about this habitat so slowly we have seen changes happening and our community growing uh, this wasn't really so in the past and uh, therefore i feel very happy that there are so many people now interested in this and are taking up research uh i will be uh, talking about specifically these three four things but i will go back and forth so i will take some time to describe uh, origin and classification of rock outcrops at least in india uh, uh, then i will talk mostly about plant diversity and uh, ecology Uh, which is related uh, some uh, points on endemism and diversification which are quite unique characters of this habitat and we have seen many interesting things in my area of western ghats but i will not concentrate only on the nature or ecology aspects because humans are very much part of this landscape so how they use this habitat what have the humans got from this habitat is also what i will talk about and finally about conservation because there are definitely threats to this habitat most of you here may have already seen uh, rock outcrops maybe they are around you maybe you have visited some of them as a part of some uh, tourism uh, areas but when one speaks about ecosystems of the world the the major ecosystems only come to mind uh, forest which is considered like the most important one ocean because it's so big uh, then of course grasslands which provide a lot of uh, food and biomass and then desert which is such a striking habitat so when one asks about which are the ecosystems that you have seen rock outcrop does not necessarily come to your mind but it still exists and if you look carefully there are present in all these ecosystems i'm quite sure that people today who are uh, from the south india or from the east india have seen landscapes like this around them 
Now, this picture specifically is from Brazil. And uh, Brazil is a uh, outcrop country in some parts. And this is picture taken by Dr. Stefan Porembaski, who is a noted scholar of rock outcrops the world over. I'm putting this picture first because this was kind of my first, uh, you know, uh, information or first uh, introduction to the habitat because I saw this in a paper. And uh, I did not know again when, uh, in my, when doing my doctorate that rock outcrops are anything special. But the area that I was working in, I was working in Western Ghats in the Murshi section. And there were things that were was seeing in monsoon, the plant communities, the herbs, the endemism, and none of that could make any sense. Till I found this paper from uh, Brazil, then I found another one from Africa, where exactly similar communities of plants were described. And that was kind of uh, an understanding that, okay, we are seeing something very different. Since then, uh, Dr. Porembaski, his writing, his students' work, and then from Various researchers, we have learned quite a lot about our own area. Rock outcrops are present everywhere in the world. Uh, they have been best studied in North America and South America. Australian rock, uh, rock outcrops are very well known. Um, Uluru, which is like the very large single uh, monolithic mountain, is a tourist spot. Apart from that, Africa, Europe, Middle East, everywhere, you have some kind of outcrops and there is a lot of research which has gone in. But when you come to Asia, when you come to especially India, very less is known even now. 20 years back, I could find almost nothing under rock outcrop heading. However, if one looks at the landscapes, rock outcrops are everywhere. So geologically, rock outcrops in India are very well known. But all the research in the world used to think of India as a black hole, like there is nothing known. Although everybody knew that rock outcrops are there, where are they in India? That was really not understood very well. Till we started getting reports from Goa and Goa plateaus. Dr. Janardhanam, who has been working there, working on uh, bladder words, he had first insights of latritic plateaus. Coming to India, they are everywhere. They differ in their geology, they differ in their origin, but best of them are seen in South India. At the same time, you have them from Northeast uh, to uh, completely West in the desert areas also. Uh, the best areas to see the Inzelbergs or the Rocky Mountains are South. Um, you may remember this very famous film, Shole, which has this beautiful rocky country or uh, those who have seen this old film called Passage to India will remember scenes shot at Ramnagar, which are the rock outcrop areas. But it took a long time for biologists to look at them and to start studying them. Rock outcrop can be divided based on their form uh, and also based on what they are composed of. So I will just quickly go through some slides which uh, will introduce these rocky areas. And I'm sure you will remember some area that you have seen in your life around. How do the outcrops form? That's a very simple question. One is that outcrops are completely natural. Many times when one sees open rocky areas, uh, they, it's, it feels like they could not be natural. Maybe they are formed by quarrying, maybe they are formed by um, landslide happening, soil getting washed away. That's not true because the, the area over which we see outcrops are very large. So these are landscape level formations. They cannot be formed by human activities alone. So they are geologically formed. How they form is if you have a landscape which has been formed, say, by igneous activity or sedimentation activity, but in which you have different types of rocky zones, some of them are softer, some of them are harder. Then in that case, what happens is once the weathering processes start, some of the softer areas get weathered very fast and soil forms. But those areas which are very hard, say granite, schist, gneiss, or some sandstone areas, they are the ones which remain as outcropping. So we have differential weathering acting on it, and then we see these mountains. Now, 
If you look at them carefully, you will see that they appear as islands. So they have been called very often terrestrial habitat islands. And that relates to why we see more endemism and why we see faster rates of speciation on these. Not all the outcrops are of the nature that I described. So uh, there is a very good book which has come uh, in the last four years ago on landscape uh, formations of India. And it gives different types of landscape formation and beautiful pictures on that. But the most common ones that we do see are Inzelbergs or island mountains. So Inzelberg is a term which has been used initially by German scientist Bonhart. Um, Bonhart worked a lot. In fact, the, the form that we are seeing is named after him. So it's a, almost a single chunk of rock. And this specific one is seen from Orissa. So this picture is from South Orissa, where they are quite common. Um, you might remember Mahabalipuram or some areas in Chhattisgarh or Jharkhand or even Madhya Pradesh, Central Indian portions. They have formations like this. And very interestingly, local people have a lot of uh, different legends attached to it. Like for an, uh, example, in Mahabalipuram, these were the areas which pandas have formed. Or uh, these were playgrounds of some demons or things like this. But all these make sure that people remember that this is a different landscape, different than what they are seeing. So outcrop have always been a very prominent feature of all cultures because they were so striking. Uh, if you have been to the Ajanta, if you have been to Elora, Elora is entirely carved out of a rocky mountain. So these were striking areas where outcrops were uh, associated with cultures. Then there are other kinds of outcrops. So this is also an Inzelberg, but here it has weathered such that we don't see the rocky face everywhere we just see large boulders so this picture again is from orissa but uh, if you remember areas in telangana around hyderabad you will see such piles of rocks and they're called as copiates that's one another form of inzelberg uh northeast and uh, even in china and other parts uh, there are limestone areas it's a different landscape it's called caste landscape but you have limestone almost forming a pavement as such very hard uh, very special kind of weathering and because it's so special it's rich in calcium then you find certain species which you will not find elsewhere but the outcrops which are close to my heart and also to my home are the western ghat outcrops and i can divide them into two one are the cliffs which are like vertical walls uh, cliffs are seen in all mountainous areas, but uh, let me just say that they are never as beautiful as Western Ghats. Although I'm quite sure that Aravli people and the Central Indian landscape people would disagree with me, but Western Ghat has sheer cliffs. Sometimes they drop about you know 800, 900 meters straight down to Kokan. Uh, very recently, Dr. Mandar Datar uh, and his students have been studying cliffs of Western Ghat and they have published a paper. And then there are plateaus. So Western Ghats, at least in the north, uh, northern Western Ghat section, are well known for the flat tops. So they are called as stable mountains. The term geomorphologically used term is often meza. And meza is like a table. So here you see uh, from Zunnar area, a cliff and plateau tops. Here they are of basalt in two levels, one slightly lower and one upper. So all this is volcanic uh, province. Deccan basalts formed on large scale in multiple pourings, and they were all, you know, flat layers. And slowly, as the landscape started forming because of weathering, we see plateaus uh, happening on that. And then there is an even more special. A uh, kind of flat plateau and which is a lateritic outcrop. So, laterite is a stone which is formed by weathering um, under certain seasonal environments. So, highly humid to highly uh, dry environment, if they keep on changing constantly uh, over millions of years, then rocks uh, change into laterite. And laterite is a stone which is rich in either aluminium or in iron or manganese. 
and this is a very hard stone. In Western Ghats, this picture is from Kolhapur, uh, but even in Kokan and in Kolhapur, Satara areas, and even southwards up to Kerala, uh, we see such outcroppings of laterite and flat plateau. Now, very often um, people ask, you know, how does one recognize an outcrop which is natural and not? So you cannot just simply by looking decide whether this is a natural outcrop or like for example this uh, somebody might say that it is formed because the forest was cut in the past but if you look at the formation of landscape from geological literature or if you mark carefully the entire area on map and try and understand how the whole landscape has formed then we realize that these are geologically formed ones they are too large to be formed by uh, humans alone but apart from that, we do find many evidences of species being endemic on it. Species which are very restricted only to these plateaus, uh, plants, animals, lichens, every taxa will have some restricted species to it. Now, that cannot form just by you know, human intervention. So if you find endemics, if you find new species, the chances are that they have been there for a long time which means the habitat also has been there for a long time. This is the area that I have focused on for past uh, many years now. And this is area where a lot of friends have taken up conservation efforts and they are really struggling very hard to protect the outcrops. Uh, if you can see my cursor, you will see this one bit of you know, break in this. Now, this is an interesting break. Uh, this is about Panchgini Mahabreshwar is about 18 degrees, 20 minutes uh, north. And everywhere above that, north of this Panchgini Mahabreshwar, one sees flat plateau, rocky plateaus of basalt. Whereas if you go south, sorry, if you go south of Mahabreshwar, at the higher range of the ghats, you see laterite. And that almost extends till Belgam area of Karnataka and sometimes even beyond that. But then in Kokan, in the Kokan Malbar region, you have uh, lateritic plateaus, very large, vast, probably one of the largest in Asia or perhaps also in the world, starting somewhere near Dapoli and continuing almost till North Kerala up to Kannu. That's where I have seen. Uh, I've put only the Maharashtra section because that's been our primary focus. But in Goa, there have been excellent reports um, from the Panji University. Uh, south of that, in the Canara, the Karnataka section, uh, Dr. T. V. Ramchandran and his team has worked. And in Kerala, there is a very strong team working, which I have read papers from them. So overall, our understanding of this landscape and of this uh, outcrop habitat has grown quite a lot. Why are they different? Now, um, you can just make out just by the sheer expanse of rock. Uh, sometimes it's more than 50% in an area, just rock. And once you have such an exposed rock, it's going to have uh, biological uh, features uh, and abiotic features which are different from this. So if you take any area um, of rock, it's going to have higher temperatures because it's going to heat up a lot. At the same time, any soil formed on that um, is going to lose moisture very quickly. So these areas, although these are little cracks in which the soil might just end up, the soil moisture gets very less uh, at the time of uh, summer. Soil depth is also less because rock, this is a rock which is very hard. It may not weather so easily. So uh, soil does not form easily or whatever is soil is formed gets washed away in the monsoon. And then you have nutrient poverty as well because the rain just washes away some of the things. So as a result of this, the plant communities that you see on this are a miniature, uh, well, forests on their own, miniature succession communities on their own. But the term that is used is called azonal. That means they are formed on soil which is not a properly formed zonal soil. And therefore, whatever kind of soil forms is going to decide what vegetation is there. And uh, there have been some studies on soil in this area, and soils are poor in phosphorus. 
because it's also highly leached because of the rainfall and that kind of dominates what kind of vegetation is going to come up there it's not that the forest doesn't exist so there are areas where you find this what are called as crops of stunted forest so this is a sacred grove from one plateau in goa and uh, you find sometimes on the plateau there's a little depression and in this you find large trees forming or there could be crevices in the outcrops where large trees can take place but this is very very rare it doesn't happen on large scale what you see is something like this now many of you may have seen pictures of latritic plateau of kas which is a world natural heritage site which has uh, you know uh, become very famous since 2012 and uh, you might see pictures of it everywhere on the net amazing flowering valley of flowers of maharashtra etc etc but if you see the same place in summer or even now if you go because this is peak summer it's Parch dry, it's completely dry. So uh, they have been called as semi-arid habitats in such cases because it's so dry. The temperatures today in Pune, the temperature is about 41 plus. I'm sure that uh, in Kas right now, during the uh, day, the temperatures will exceed 50. Uh, so once we had tried doing 24-hour data counting from the air temperature and from the soil temperature, uh, at about 10 o'clock. It just shot past 60 degrees, uh, about 10 centimeters from the earth. And then after, there was a point of time when the thermometer just went blank, the digital thermometer, because it just heated up so much. But if you go there in the evening time, in night time, this is about 1,000 meters above sea level. And therefore, you get uh, sometimes the clouds coming down. Uh, it becomes very foggy even during peak summer, and it can become very chilly at night. So the vegetation here has to deal with such extremes. So there are seasonal extremes and there are also daily diurnal uh, changes that keep happening. But otherwise for six to eight months, this is what you see. Very dry, very boring from a biologist's point of view. Now if you go there in June, you will have the same area turn into a wetland. Now this is ephemeral wetland because it's going to be very short-lived. The minute the showers start, the whole area gets water pools, um, water stagnates. For vegetation, uh, it's like a queue, you know, they, it just starts because for them, the life cycle is going to be very short. So for the first few uh, weeks of monsoon, you suddenly see everything turning green, everything uh, trying to photosynthesize and build up biomass as soon as possible. These are all uh, mostly short curves. And then comes this amazing time. And when the sun starts coming out around September, you see this mass blooming. Now, mass blooming, very often people feel that it's a unique phenomenon to cast that is. No, it's not so. Mass blooming is actually a strategy used by rocky outcrop plants the world over. It's very simple. They have very short life. The only way they are going to live is if they can just reproduce as soon as possible. And looking at the size of them, if you start reproducing one by one, it's never going to be successful. What they need is mass advertisement for bringing in the pollinators. So everything happens at once. The blues, the yellows, the pinks, everything starts. And it's very obvious. So now on cars, it draws tourists. But it's not meant for tourists, it's basically meant for pollinators to come and do their work. And this, you know, continues maybe for a month or so. And generally in Maharashtra, around the Ganpati uh, festival time, it's a peak. And I think in Kerala, uh, around festival time, I think Odam comes at that time, there is a peak flowering. And after that, immediately as the uh, rain stops, everything starts drying and the grass takes its place grass grows and uh, it starts becoming dry very soon that's the end of monsoon so the life revolves around these seasonalities now what kind of life exists in such extreme habitats uh, well actually all sorts of taxa are there i have heard you know people come to plateau during summer time and say oh but it was so dead it there was nothing it is barren plateau and that's a mistake that has been done by many scientists also. 
So in the papers, you will see that uh, scientists have written barren plateau or uh, you know completely dead vegetation. It's not dead; it's just dormant. So there is life on every single inch of this habitat, and it's quite interesting. So uh, to understand a rocky plateau, it's uh, easier to divide the big habitat into smaller habitats, micro habitats as we call it, because each has its own speciality. The uh, the most important of the micro habitats of this is, from my point of view, the rock itself. The rock itself is uh, supporting a lot of cryptogams. That's the uh, non-flowering vegetation. So here, what you see, the white ones are all lichens, and there are many types. Uh, this is crustose or saxicolous lichens, rock lichen. Um, we do have a lot of saxicolous lichens all over the country. Uh, in Western Ghats, in this section especially, Dr. Gargi Pandit was working, and she has been uh, finding new things, new uh, lichens everywhere. So there are cyano lichens. There are uh, other kinds of lichens. I'm not an expert at all on lichens, but it's very interesting. And the part that you see black, it's actually uh, not rock, but a fine crust of cyanobacteria, cyanolichen, cyanobacteria, all mixed up. If you have been to such areas in monsoon, they are very slippery, and that slipperiness is because of the cyanolichens that are present on the outcrop. This fine uh, crust, uh, it's sometimes called biological uh, crust or biological soil crust. This crust itself is enough for some plants. So this, this is a species of Muldania, and uh, it just grows in uh, a layer of cyanobacteria, which is not even one millimeter probably. They just grow, and they grow in millions, and very short-lived. All they have to do is build up enough energy to produce a flower, and the rest of the work is done. Another crucial part of the cryptogamic crust are mosses, and there are quite a few. Um, I know one uh, moss researcher is brave enough to venture into this uh, really difficult taxon, uh, Shrikan Gun, sir, and uh, uh, he just opened my eyes to the world of mosses here. You know, because I always found it very difficult taxa. Mosses, bryophytes, all of them, I found them very difficult. But they are so amazing. They are so beautiful. And on rocky outcrops, they have a special place because they form large cushions. Um, as you know, mosses have this uh, special ability to desiccate. Like they can just go completely dry. And uh, once the rain comes, they can just rejuvenate from there. So they play a very important role because they provide these cushions provide a support to some of the lithophytes like this Eria reticosa. It's an orchid. Um, again, it's a perennial, but you can see that the real part is this little pseudo bulb, which is so tiny that you may not even notice it among the moss cushions. Leaves are very small, but the flowers are very very large, fragrant, very beautiful. Again, this is to attract insects. So this species flowers when uh, conditions are very foggy. Um, if you come to any rocky plateau, especially the higher altitude plateau during, uh, say, July or August, the conditions are impossible to imagine from your home. The wind is blowing. It's trying to just push you off, uh, off the cliff probably. The rain slashes at you. Uh, these areas face rain, which is about 600 to 800 centimeters uh, in those four months. And it's a very, very vicious kind of climate. Not a good idea for any pollinator to be about. But this species is so attractive, so it's trying to attract some pollinator or other, even during these foggy, windy conditions. And it obviously is successful in that. We do also have different kinds of uh, ferns, uh, pteridophytes on the plateaus, again in the soil, in the moss cushions. Uh, this especially is seen, I think, all over the uh, Western Ghats. This is a silver fern. Now, why I've shown it is because it has this interesting character. Although it's a fern, it has the same kind of desiccation tolerance like the lower plants. So these are, this, the 
dried leaves that you see they are not dead they are just desiccated so this uh, condition is called poikilohydry poikilohydry means ability to uh, desiccate without really drying out so this is an advantage so if you look at it this is a perennial plant but it has this advantage of being able to desiccate the minute it gets some rain uh, it just opens up uh, sometimes at tourist places they take these plants and put them in water and uh, then say oh it is sanjeevani booty and it will give you rejuvenated life or something like this stories like this a few ferns do have this capacity and there is silagenella species which is uh, there are some silagenella in the uh, central indian landscape on the outcrops which are exactly like this and sometimes in the market you also get some larger silagenella uh, species which have this rejuvenating ability so this is um, a special feature which helps them to adapt to the rocky plateau conditions because they are going to be uh, there so they don't have to worry about losing their place and they can just continue from where they left off in the last monsoon um, in this uh, habitat finding a space for yourself is really very important and therefore these plants have an advantage in there now uh, desiccation tolerance is very well known in the lower groups like silt pseudophytes bryophytes people have always seen it what is more interesting uh, is that here this ability is shown also by higher plants and in this case a grass so i have shown a picture of trypogons lisboa but many trypogons have this ability uh, you see them on slips and this is a dry form and the uh, if it gets water then it becomes like it opens out and becomes green again again uh, you know when we think of perennials we think only of forest or we think of tree but for this habitat these are the perennials so these are the oldest leaf uh, inhabitants probably and they have their special features they may not look like they are perennial or they may not look like they are old but it's quite possible that the clumps are as old as any tree to exist on rocks you need to have a lot of adaptation and one of the adaptation that this trypogon shows is called mat formation uh the roots of the trypogon they mat with each other they find uh, they create such a you know fine mesh and they have certain ways of adhering to the direct rock uh if you see vertical walls of cliff in western ghats sometimes it's so uh, so straight one doesn't know how the grass finds a foothold there but this ability probably helps them uh to get attached to this uh in western ghats and in india in general we have very less research so we are looking forward to research which is by agarkar research institute group uh they are working on these aspects uh in india i think there are just eight or nine plants which have been reported ages ago like 30 40 years back they reported all over the world uh, there are some 300 to 400 species only which have been reported to have this ability now this is very important ability when one thinks of climate change now trypogons are grasses there are people who are trying to decode how they are able to uh, just break down their entire photosynthesis apparatus and reconstruct it again as soon as they get water if we learn that from some species that is something that can be uh, leading us to future crops when the climate really changes uh, to extreme other species which love the extreme habitats of outcrops are the succulents so you have euphorbias of different types this is from bangalore and you have euphorbias on the rocky plateaus in western ghats this particular one has been going through a lot of name changes a beautiful plant very small this is the these are the inflorescences which come out at this time um, in the peak summer uh, probably it has already flowered and fruited and seeds have been dispersed uh, this is now euphorbia candalensis you see it only on the higher plateaus but there are other euphorbias which seem to be having such characters also another uh, thing that these species have tried is vegetative propagation so the leaf itself gets bulbous at the end at the tip of it 
but you also have a lot of liliaceae members or um, uh, you know those have bulbs and this is dipcardi concanens uh, dipcardi is again a special feature of outcrops in many places but this one is specific to kokand it is seen uh, from ratnagiri onwards to just the tip of uh, goa and uh, it considered threatened spine but here there are places uh, which are not so disturbed which are not so heavily used by people where it can really form its uh, own this picture is contributed by mangesh savan uh, who took it in the nana area of ratnagiri another habitat is seasonal rock pools they are uh, like a lifeline for some species uh, there are also it is water ferns that grow in this uh, sometimes you have fish sometimes you have water beetles uh, dr john who is with us today he has worked on uh, these habitats uh, for plants this is uh, special there are you see some hydrophytes there so wydmeria triandra um, it's an endemic species which is seen in uh, seasonal rock pools you also have aponogeton sathariensis probably the only aponogeton in india to have a y shaped or bifurcated um, inflorescence it was discovered from satara from the plateau of maushi by dr esa yadav who has studied uh, and probably done the most taxonomic work on the rocky plateaus of maharashtra um, amazing uh, insights from the taxonomic work uh from him and his group have helped us to understand the ecology better such rock pools are also home to certain animals so this is toyops uh, granarius that portion um an ancient form invertebrate it inhabits the rock pools uh these are also places where you see a lot of amphibians uh which have their life around this obviously this one is so well camouflaged that uh, it is you know it is so uh, well camouflaged to a lateritic plateau that it probably has some connection in evolution with this and then this is this tiny little thing um amboli toad uh, which is definitely has originated on the lateritic plateau in and around amboli area um i will not go into details of that but please do read up papers on that uh, to see how it has adapted to the Laterite habitat. So these little tiny uh, holes are what are important to this tiger, uh, to this amboli toad. And uh, what draws attention of most people is uh, technically known as ephemeral flush vegetation, a term which has been coined uh, by Watt long time back. Uh, ephemeral flush vegetation is a term given to a community of annuals. Um, which grow on gently sloping area where water is just slowly moving seeping through and in paleotropical region in india as well as in africa the two dominant genera are eriocolons and uticularia so the white here are the eriocolons uh, and uticularia are the blue ones they are the bladder worms the insect eating species a closer look at eriocolon it's not a grass it's a grass like species many people might think it but this has got a bunch of flowers and it has got abundant nectar really abundant so much so that when eriocolons flower a lot of insects are seen visiting it this is a moth that we uh, photographed some time back from kolhapur plateau and uh, they seem to be loving it although the flowers look very small they uh, obviously have good amount of nectar in that and then you have these tricky uh brook bladder worts so these are insectivorous plants but the flowers are not insectivorous they don't eat insects the insect eating part is on the uh, underground on the uh, roots there are little bladders which are like balloons which are the ones catching insects so this is a speciality of the western ghat plateaus and this is uticularia reticulata from the konkan region but there are many species more than 20 have been reported many of them are specific to this habitat very large plants um, uh, all the rest of the world envies india for its uh, large uticularias and bladder worms because everywhere else they are quite small there are other carnivorous plants also this drosera burmani um, 
it's quite a clever little thing which is catching large insects and this is an interesting uh, observation made by one of our students who's a spider uh, specialist uh, siddharth kulkarni and he had noted that these spiders actually come and steal from the uh, plant so this one has caught a uh, caught a grasshopper and this spider actually is able to steal it so he, it doesn't uh, you know go away we in the forest we are so used to seeing fights between carnivorous animals we don't realize that this such things can be happening such interactions could be happening also unfortunately for ecological studies we have not been able to move too much past the endemism we have not been able to look at interactions or nutrient uptake and i hope that some of you who are uh, listening to this webinar or those who will uh, go out and probably look at these habitats take up such interesting studies because these are like you know uh, open books uh, there is a lot that has never been seen before because nobody used to treat them very seriously uh, so sir i think i'm just going to go through this uh, quickly because some of you may have already seen it then another interesting group is siropegia and this is siropegia artenio et al photographed by uh, my friend swapna prabhu dr swapna prabhu she did uh, some of the first work on konkan plateaus and noted many uh, interesting things and uh, this siropegia artenio et al is also having a lot of kind of sister species probably speciated from it long time back or related to it so siropegia jaihi you find on amboli plateaus up to almost satara siropegia anjanerica you will find in one plateau on anjaneri hills in nashik and like that so you have a lot of uh, areas where species have become restricted probably they were once upon a time all close to each other and then as uh, the Islanding effect started. They started to uh, diversify from each other. New species have been reported very frequently from rocky plateaus, and that's true for all taxa, from lichens to the flowering plants, and from the invertebrates to the snakes. New species have been reported, and uh, that's very obvious that it has to do something with the way the habitat is uh, distributed. uh more than 100 endemics definitely i would say the people are still counting recently some paper has come out from agarkar research institute uh look, taking a re look at how many species are there and lateritic plateaus have a very uh, strong um contribution overall to the western ghat ecology and endemism uh many of them are Uh, you can see that they are actually uh, evolved to have insect pollinators so you have many insects which are related to that uh, mass blooming helps definitely support large communities of insects everywhere and these are the insects which are then going to go into the agricultural areas into the fruit crop areas vegetable gardens and pollinate them so uh, plateaus are known for their ecosystem services pollinator service being one very important other fauna we see a lot of evidence of like the spider just under a boulder uh, we also see indirect evidence of ants using uh, this habitat very frequently and this is an ant line which is formed how do they contribute to the growth of vegetation we still have to understand and many many things one you have to be very careful about this uh, saw scale which seems to be like a happy inhabitant of most rocky plateaus and uh, scorpions crickets ki different kinds of invertebrates are known another group which seems to be proliferating on this are grasshoppers and interestingly anywhere you go uh, they seem to be matching camouflaging to whatever is the texture of the rock so i have seen that this is a large grain uh, granite and the grasshopper is nicely matching it uh, but if you go to a uh, uh, Lateral plateau, you will see reddish ones. If you go to a basalt plateau, you will see uh, blackish ones. So uh, some relationship with that. This picture is from uh, rocky uh, outcrop in Zilberg from near Bangalore, and you see the sagama. Now look at the uh, beautiful coloration on its back, and look at the coloration here. Now this is not a rock color. This is a lichen, Saxicolus lichen, which gives it the orange color. Um, 
quite well known. So uh, we have seen several interesting things on outcrops uh, which are related to you know how uh, things may have been adapted to this. Hemidactylus genus definitely has close association with outcrops. All over India, they have been seen. Dr. Varadgiri, who has worked extensively on this uh, taxon, he has reported many new species. This is Hemidactylus adam bobbery from the cliffs uh, of Nanekhat uh, near Pune. Uh, but you have Hemidactylus satarensis from the Satara Plateau. You have Hemidactylus albopatiatus from the Ratnagiri Plateau, and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm quite sure that there will be more and more discovered as people work in Chhattisgarh and uh, Northeast India and uh, in other parts, they will be noticing this. There are some species which have been known uh, from the granitic hill, granitic colus, and So uh, there are just many things waiting to be understood from these habitats. There are certain birds which use it, Malabar lark, which has used this as a um, nesting site. Coming to the people, people and outcrops are known to interact a lot. Like uh, if you look far back, uh, if you think of the beam bed caves, which people used as shelter, from then on, rock outcrops have been sheltering people. And people do have, humans have a lot of presence on and around the outcrop. Uh, this is a little shrine, and many of the shrines in South India have uh, their place on. And Ingelberg, uh, Rocky Mountain. Many of them, like the uh, Shaman Bergura, the whole mountain is considered sacred uh, because of the presence of uh, religious shrine there. In Kokan, very recently, there has been discovery uh, from uh, Ratnagiri area of petroglyph. Probably around 2000 to 4000 year old, new things are being studied on that. Why I'm showing this is because this is Devi Hasur. Uh, one uh, area where a petroglyph is present just outside a uh, temple and is considered sacred, it's part of some ritual. And on the same plateau, a new species of Leptoceriella has been reported by Dr. Samir Padhe. So we do have this very interesting habitat with unique biodiversity, unique cultural features, and that is like a heritage for us in many places. So we have been trying to work on conservation looking at the heritage aspect from natural as well as cultural points of view. So outcrop, it seems, in Kokan have been used as, um, you know, sketch pads by ancient humans. And uh, there are some figures that have no not been deciphered now, but this obviously is a rhino figure. And there is a full, uh, you know, size rhino on one of the Kokan outcrops. We don't know how and when it was made. Um, I was talking more about cultural services, but another important service from rocky outcrop is of water. They form water catchments and uh, they are quite interesting uh, to people from that point of view. The whole laterite sometimes acts as a sponge for rainwater, and that kind of uh, you know helps people with perennial springs. Here you see uh, on the top the lateritic layer absorbs rainwater. And the water trickles down. So here, these are the places where you find uh, perennial springs coming out. This picture is from Mopa Goa Plateau, and uh, Mopa uh, uh, sadly is no more. But when we visited Mopa and went around it, we found this ancient water systems uh, which have been supporting people. So all they have to do is to have a little line of pipe. And the water keeps trickling throughout the year. That's the beauty of it. So laterite, uh, lateritic springs are very well known. Similarly, if you look at the granitic outcrops, they have uh, large ponds just next to the outcrops. Think of any Bangalore Inzelberg which has not been quarried, and you will find a pond and a shrine next to it. So they have very important services. But um, out of all this, we still have been calling them as baselines. So none of this has been obvious to people. I don't know for what reason. And if you look at the government records, which are again from the colonial times, uh, where outcrops were thought of as areas which are completely useless for agriculture. And therefore the term wasteland was given. 
and 70 years later, we still continue to use the same term. Many of the outcrops are not in protected areas. So then they are open to quarrying like this, uh, mining of bauxite from uh, Satara, Kolhapur Plateau, Goa. Devastation on the plateaus has been done. Quarrying, because uh, stones, laterite, nice, are all very precious decorative stones. They have been quarried, they have been used uh, now they are used in decorative, uh, you know, architecture. Then you also have outcrops because they are thought of as wasteland. You can do anything with it, right? So um, they have been ideal places, especially the higher altitude ones are ideal places for having windmills, wind farms. And Maharashtra has large wind farms, about 1,000 more um, windmills on one plateau. And look at what happens sometimes to the poor little raptors which are there. Now this picture is from Pune district itself. It's a vulture lying dead, obviously hit by a wind farm, but no UN cry. It's not tiger, it's not anything you know which is of critical national importance. So it does not get any attention. But this must be happening constantly. And wherever rock outcrops are left, they are also now thought of as something that needs to be afforested. They're seen as useless areas. And in this billion tree plantation campaign, we have been uh, seeing people just going up and digging up beautiful areas. I really do not understand how people could have thought of plantation here. It's such a beautiful area, but then you have necessity to complete your plantation targets. Another growing worry that we have is tourism. Although tourism is less of a havoc than the other um, developmental pressures that I was talking about, it still can be very damaging because these are fragile habitats. These have large amount of endemics and often new species on them. So tourism of this nature, this is from Kaas, this is really not sustainable. And a lot of people have uh, struggled to make it better and today, uh, we have forest department team, teaming up with communities to take care of it. But there could be other ways of tourism and conservation tourism is something that we can have. This is Swapna Prabhu. She used to take a lot of awareness camps on this in Kokan and that's probably what we can see. The hidden pressures I, from my point of view are the most worried. This is Mopa which has been completely gone now. Uh, although people struggled a lot for conservation. But Mopa uh, is now um, destined to be the airport that Goa probably never needed. Um, so many outcrops are facing various threats like this. We have a group in Sindhu Durga which has been struggling uh, to conserve whatever is left from the beautiful plateaus of Sindhu Durga district. Uh, when I say we, uh, we have again a large number of people who have been interested in studying or conserving plateaus and we have a Facebook group where you can see some of the faces. We also have a website where we give basic information about it. Uh, my first interest in this habitat was purely research but over the years I realized that if I continue to do research I will not have anything to left to research on because you know they would be gone by that time and that's when uh, everybody you know told me that we have to get into conservation and this whole group of ours, uh, we did this mind mapping exercise as part of uh, one project which was funded by CEPF HE small grant program to look at conservation as a focus and then how do we go about it, what are the steps we do. So one person can't do all of this, all of us can do little bits of it and the only great thing that I feel is that all over Kokan at least and even in other parts in Amboli and in Satara and in Karnataka, people have woken up and local people already knew about it. So they have been protesting against mega projects coming in. 
and uh, imagine my surprise when I was just passing through uh, one area near Nanar, which is the proposed oil refinery, and I saw this poster which was put up by the local, uh, you know, activist group, and the whole entire village had uh, come together to put a position to this refinery. And it says in Marathi, it says that we oppose this refinery because it's going to disturb uh, flowers on the plateau. What more does one want uh, in conservation? When the local community itself starts supporting conservation of the habitat it is living on. We have been doing a lot of, uh, we have been engaging with the policy makers, with the senior managers in Maharashtra. We have received a lot of uh, good support from the Forest Department of Maharashtra. This is from 2012. And they continue to support rocky plateaus. And I'm quite sure that all over country, there will be uh, such people and forest departments which will be supporting it. Uh, Long-term policy goal is to ensure that not only rock outcrops, but no part of India is called a wasteland. We, have, we are a mega biodiversity country. How can we have uh, you know, a wasteland in our thing? And uh, lastly, uh, these are just a few conservation achievements that we have uh, tried to get as a part of a group. Uh, we have uh, Zui Pethe and Amit who have been working in Nashik. They got Anjaneri declared as a conservation reserve. A whole team of us, including Bombay Environmental Action Group, worked on Satara and Pajgali Mahabreshwar plateaus to support it. And now we have very strong support from Wildlife Conservation Trust. Uh, to which we have been working on spoken plateaus and our we have already proposed biodiversity heritage side because that seems to be the ideal legal category. Uh, we did a lot of awareness campaigns and in, although I'm talking uh, in English right now, we have been doing a lot of campaigning in Marathi. We have posters, we have little films and all in local languages. So. We have a little manual which has been recently translated in Konkani also. Hopefully it will be available soon. And all of this is in public domain. So all the research that any of us has done, any every word that we all have written, is everything is in public domain and we want it to be like that. Um, I really take time to you know uh, thank Wildlife Conservation Trust because they, their help came at the right time where we could reach out to Pokern and organizations in there. And uh, we are hoping that these 10 sites that we have proposed get biodiversity, as, uh, get identified as biodiversity heritage sites. So with this, uh, I end here. I have already talked almost for an hour, probably a little over time that uh, was budgeted. But uh, the whole idea was that uh, you know, it's not only Maharashtra and Kerala or Karnataka which have rock outcrops. It's a prominent habitat, a special habitat all over India. So wherever you are and wherever you are listening to this, uh, please look at your habitats. Uh, please look at what kind of biodiversity exists. And I'm quite sure that you are going to find something of interest. Um, that's all for the moment. David has uh, already posted saying that this is question and answer time. Um, David. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Aparna. Yeah, it was wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. And yeah, we just opened the box for question and answer. You can go through it. Yeah. Start answering. Shall I go through the questions quickly and then get back? Or have you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. probably you can just go through the questions. Yes, okay, I'll start from the beginning and uh, yes. Oh, I see a lot of familiar names, people who have been contributing to our knowledge. Uh, there is a question here. Is there a evidence of tigers using rock outcrops as habitat or wildlife corridor? Uh, well, in Amboli, uh, they have been uh, reporting tigers as such. But uh, I see any large mammal such as this they are not going to use just one habitat. So it's an overall landscape and the landscape diversity, which is important. Um, there have been camera trap studies which have reported uh, leopard and many other mammals, including the wolf, uh, which is occupying these habitats. Bats have been reported in the caves of outcrops. Uh, 
Yes, so there is another question. How do outcrops play a role in speciation? And that's by uh, Dr. Makran Daitavde, who is a botanist. Uh, see, speciation, uh, I mean, there are many ways in which it can happen. But uh, here what happens is that the outcrops, if they're isolated long enough from the nearby uh, habitats or from the other outcrops, Anything that is present there, the species are going to probably just breed among themselves. And therefore, whatever little character that we see them is going to be kind of amplified. So much so that after a while, we think of them as a separate species. Um, I would give example of Syropagia, definitely. And Syropagia, we can uh, mark this in Syropagia, uh, the small erect Syropagia groups. Uh, but also uh, work by uh, uh, Dr. Mayur on Pomelinaceae, we do see a lot of uh, speciation in those groups also, which might be related. But again, to be more specific and to be very sure, because we haven't really done any studies on speciation in the plants in this habitat, we need to be very, very sure. Uh, and uh, the way to go is, I would say, study the DNA and uh, Dr. Ritesh and Dr. Mandar have been trying to do it for Ereocolons. But uh, it's been a whole thing and uh, you have to study the habitat, its origin, uh, see the species, uh, like the at least the diversification that might be happening at DNA level and try to link all the processes. So it's not just a morphological evidence, but a lot of different evidence from environmental history also, which can help. Uh, Dr. John, who is present in here, he has tried to do this for uh, the invertebrate taxa, water beetles, ants, and uh, the results are yet to come out. Oh, I'm so happy to see this uh, question. Has there been any study on Savana Durga, the largest monolith in Asia? Uh, Sanadji, um, there is one study on Savan Durga, and uh, that study almost entirely focuses on the forest below. And Savan Durga uh, was first introduced to me by Dr. Ravi Kumar ages ago uh, when he said, if you have not seen Savan Durga, you have not seen outcrops at all. And first, you have to do your pilgrimage to Savan Durga. And uh, it's such an amazing um, monolith, really. It's imposing. Um, Outcrop-wise, uh, it is covered. Like, there are uh, the Bangalore flora and the uh, various, uh, you know, reports do cover outcrop flora a lot from South India, but they don't mention it as specific to this area. So very often you have to interpret, okay, this is, uh, okay, this is, when they say hilly area, that probably means Savandurga or Nandi Hills means, okay, uh, probably a Kopia area and such things you have to kind of interpret from that. Uh, last time I went to Savan Durga about three years back, uh, I was hoping a lot to go up and I had botanists with me, one German and one Indian. Uh, they did not allow us to go there. They said it's now off limits, there have been mishaps and I don't know whether that continues, but I would be really happy if one can do a whole taxa study of Savan Durga itself. Uh, Bhagyashree Kasar has written how she would like to um, participate or how she can participate, how students can participate. Uh, really, you can participate initially by joining the Facebook group. Uh, you have to answer questions of why you would like to join. Take a look at outcrop literature. Uh, if you are a student from either botany, zoology, or life sciences, or geology, then I'm sure you can do a lot of work. But even otherwise, if you really find them interesting, uh, you can join many of the groups which are working either as an intern, uh, if you are a graduate or postgraduate student, and later on as a researcher, depending upon what your interests are. Uh, Ashwini Vijay is writing, is there any relation of Inselberg in the landmark formation? phytogeography? Uh, well, I would quickly give an answer to that, yes. Uh, but I would suggest that uh, you read the phytogeography literature from whichever area interests you. Uh, biogeography uh, book 
uh, an old one by money probably will be interesting but on the whole uh, do take a look at uh, books by um, university of rostock in germany um, there is a whole book called engelberg which is now 20 years old but that's kind of a state of art of that time they are revising it now uh, and you will uh, have information from engelberg all over the world except india and this time the indian information also would uh, get in aha uh, -huh. uh so payal is asking me what is the name of the uh, book that i spoke about the book is on uh, landscapes i don't have the precise name right now but look at uh, landforms of india and uh, or google it on scholar and the book is by vasan uh, sorry uh, vishwas kare sir who is a very noted geologist and geomorphologist so uh, interesting very interesting book very very highly prized book but i'm quite sure that in the covid time they may have opened it up you know to some library so do take a look at it um yes and there are more comments any dhs already declared from rock out of area in india uh, dr akhila not that i know of from other parts of the country uh, because dhs is quite a new term but in kokan when we did this uh, one year project and we worked a lot with local community just reaching out to them through social media and um, marathi language literature um, in one area they already uh, bombe natural history society and dr sapna prabhu had studied the uh, area a lot about 5 years back in 2016 the village gram panchayat of amborgad went ahead and declared dhs on its own now that's quite a, a progressive step and they said very specifically that uh, we would like to preserve it as our heritage and it's a detailed write up in marathi um that is the first step when a community uh, says that this is dhs so it is a declared dhs but it also needs a, uh, a support from the state government uh, which will actually publish it as a gr and then it needs to be registered with the natural national biodiversity board uh, now all these processes have, processes have come to a standstill because of the covid situation but i'm quite sure that uh, we will be able to see this through and get it accepted and finally declared uh, openly uh, dr sarar has written karnataka has a lot to learn from your work how would you describe rock outcrop habitat of bhimgarh wildlife sanctuary uh, adjoining goa uh, sarar ji i have not been to bhimgarh wildlife sanctuary uh i really don't know the area very well karnataka has diversity i'm just going to say a little bit in general now so karnataka has uh, granitic engelberg as well as lateritic plateaus and probably there are some other undiscovered areas so uh, badami uh, hampi areas again sandstone um, engelberg everything you can see Bhimgarh, if it's closer to the Western Ghats, it's probably more similar to the uh, Western Ghat outcrops that we have been seeing. Uh, uh, Dr. Yadav, student, have been working on Bergao area and uh, specifically on the plateaus. So I'm quite sure that you will find papers uh, from this area very soon. Mm. Oh, okay. There are fifty-one. You mentioned that. there are water springs all over has water conservation been dropping uh, towards the effort to save this wetland well uh, not really so far although we are trying very hard to uh, document water services uh, i'm not sure if harshad turpure is in the in this audience but uh, harshad uh, is from uh, ratagiri district and one of the things that he is likely to look at is just what is the value of that water so valuation of ecosystem services probably he will be looking at and that would be our argument against the wasteland status but no um water conservationist as such have not really looked at it 
exception is Dr. Jared Bono, who was a hydrogeologist, and Remy Thomas, who have been work, working on lateritic springs. And they had uh, excellent documentation from that. Uh, I know that they are planning to do more studies. And uh, Remy, at least, I'm quite sure that he will be able to continue with his studies and give us many new things. Probably choose some relevant ones there. So many questions are piling yeah, up. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, can you quickly take a look and let me know? You which also one? have a look at I don't know oh. which one to. Yeah, so just an openly to everybody that uh, you will find uh, rock outcrop of India. It's a, uh, you can just, you know, add me and then uh, find rock outcrop of India or go to the website or go through this uh, presentation for the link. And uh, well, Siddharth Biniwale uh, has asked about convincing the locals for conservation. I described a case of Ratnagiri and Amborgar, but uh, in also other area, I would say look at uh, Anjaneri and uh, there have been stories on how Anjaneri got declared and has got complete support of the locals of Anjaneri. Uh, responsible ecotourism, well, uh, uh, it, it needs planning, you know. Uh, at one place, Panjgani table land, we had to actually go up to the Supreme Court to make the tourism responsible. And even now, it's still a struggle. Uh, in caste, things happen much more easily. It all depends upon uh, many social, political, legal angles to that. Uh, but I think if one calls it ecotourism and looks at the values that have been uh, put forth for understanding ecotourism and uh, how it should be, not only environmentally, but also socially just. Uh, I'm sure that uh, you will find good examples or you can create good examples. Uh, yeah, uh, David, can you... Probably sc scroll down and choose uh, uh, five more questions. Okay. Then okay. probably you can put down your email ID, let them come. Is it okay? I've overshot time. No problem, no problem. Okay. Thank you so much, then. Okay, you can thank you. Those who are attending, and you know, if you have any question, you can write to uh, her. Sure. Anyway, uh, uh, so David, yes, you could you ask uh, about desiccation tolerance? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. is it is it happened in uh, Westward also? Well, uh, it's very hard to say how it happened as an adaptation. Uh, people in Europe have been studying it. Africa have been studying it. Uh, no, these adaptations are not because they happen to be of, uh, in lateritic outcrops. Uh, they can be anywhere. So we don't know when this originated. Probably this originated many, many times in different eras, in different groups. Because you see this right from the lowest of the forms, cyanobacteria, cyanolichens, where it's so simple, to uh, grasses, which is a evolved form. Uh, in Madagascar, you have even trees which can be like, you know, not trees, but they are tree-like, arborescent uh, ones which have desiccation tolerance. So it's a, it has evolved probably multiple times. Uh, we can only kind of guess under which conditions they may have evolved, which is the highly seasonal, highly unpredictable kind of um, environment. Okay. And uh, maybe... That's why when they found such areas, they have become uh, dominant. Now, Trypogon as a genus is present in many places. I, I believe even in uh, America, they have Trypogon and they are called as four minute grasses. And because they, they get green as soon as you water them in four minutes or so. Uh, but in India, they, in Western Ghats, especially, they cover large areas like. Uh, nowhere in the world you will have such vast cliff areas covered by desiccation tolerant plants. So obviously there is something in our environment, the seasonal, extreme seasonality, which is conducive to them. But that does not necessarily mean that they have evolved there. They may have evolved somewhere else and come and colonized it. So really hard to say. Um, 
I think you can take a look at uh, literature by Professor Zoltan Tuba uh, from Hungary. He's no more, but he has got a very interesting uh, monograph on uh, desiccation tolerant plants. Okay. Thank you so much, Abarna. I mean, I had saved all the chats, so probably I'll send you. You can go through it. Any questions okay, we can write okay. to them. Yeah. Sure. Anyway, uh, thank you so much. It was wonderful to hear you. I mean, one of the finest talk. I mean, it's good to hear you again. And uh, on behalf of Kotem Nature Society and uh, Alapi Natural Society, we extend our thanks. And stay safe, all of you. And thank you so much and good night. Thank you so much.